first came to the Asia Society in 1975 and uh, headed, founded and headed the China Council of the Asia Society and then went on to become vice president and they moved me to, Bo uh, to uh, Washington where I was uh, head of the Washington office and then in 1981 I became president of the Asia Society. I was president until 1992. I think the founding of it in the first place was an achievement that was remarkable. Uh, it seems like ancient history now, but there was, uh, there was a tremendous uh, pressure on John Rockefeller to uh, provide money for an India society and a China society. And uh, uh, instead, he said, look, yes, the Japan society already existed, which is great. But why not, why not actually have a single institution representing all of these cultures? After all, not only are they rich civilizations, but they're, they're a kind of uh, blank mark in the American consciousness. We don't know anything about Asia. And then what was even more bold was it was founded in 1956, right after the, the McCarthy period and where there was an enormous amount of suspicion around people who were uh, dealing with and thinking about and talking about uh, communist countries. And the decision, therefore, to move ahead with an Asian society had some polit took political guts to do that. Uh, and admittedly, there was a kind of cultural emphasis at the beginning, so you didn't hit all of the hot subjects of the time. But it, it clearly, I think that, that, was, that was a bold moment. In many ways, we were very lucky. The economic takeoff of Asia in the 1980s, following Japan in the 1960s, and you know the emergence of South Korea and Taiwan in the 1970s, and then you know joined by uh, the rest of Southeast Asia, and uh, that became a magnetic story for a lot of people. I think another great moment was, uh, in fact, when. Um, when China emerged as a very big, uh, big issue in our time. I mean, you, one must remember that when Nixon went to China, as many people were watching him land there as watched uh, Armstrong, Neil Armstrong, land on the moon. Exactly. They had a 93% you know, uh, rating or however that's done. So it was that kind of moment. And we were very much a part of uh, some of the exchanges that occurred thereafter. And one I remember very well was uh, when Deng Xiaoping came to, you know, powerful Deng Xiaoping, and I, I had a chance to meet with him when I was there. But the, the um, episode that sticks with me most is, I, yeah, I was a junior guy at the Asia Society in those days. We went to the... Um, uh, the new wing of uh, the uh, uh, the gallery, National Gallery in Washington, and they laid out the room, but it had no ashtray next to him. And of course, Deng Xiaoping was a chain smoker, and so I single-handedly went out and got this bronze ashtray and I put it next to him. And unfortunately, he had been told he couldn't smoke because it was a museum, so he never used my special ashtray. But as he left. He accidentally kicked this thing, and it went boom like this. And I thought, oh, my God, this is a turning point, and I was part of it. It's sort of for whom the bell tolls. It was just a, a beautiful moment. Of course, there's a cultural core that comes out of the history of the Asian society, the art, the performing arts, the wonderful world of uh, the late Beati Gordon, who just did great things for this institution. But it, uh, it was a period in which there was a very different clientele that began to come to the Asian society. We grew as an institution. Membership grew. The number of Asian Americans who became part of this institution uh, as members, but also as members of the staff. When I first came to the Asian society, there were only two staff members of Asian descent. And now it's, what, 40, 50 percent of the... Uh, and then the, the change occurred in my watch. 
Um, so it was partly a question of a changing view of what Asia was about. The politics, the economics became important subjects. The exchanges of leaders on both sides and the uh, attention that that garnered in, in the press. But I think more deeply there was an awareness that America, American Asians, Asian Americans who lived here were becoming part of the fabric of all of this. It changed the way in which New York City looked as it's, at itself. The Asianization of New York City was a big story. Schools started thinking that they had to have studies of, you know, Asian history and Asian culture and increasingly Asian language and that notion that everybody wanted to have, you know, a, a Chinese ama to take care of their kids so that they could learn the language of the future. All of that was, uh, you know, emerged, first of all, in the, in the 1980s. But something else also happened, and that is that travel to Asia uh, became uh, a standard in American society. You had to, so many people felt they had to go to China or they had to go to India, they had to go to Southeast Asia to see it for themselves. And uh, the flow back and forth. The influx of uh, students from Asia and Americans going to Asia as students took off in the 1980s. So it was a terrific time to be president of the Asia Society. We went from a period in which the interest in Asia in the 60s and 70s was almost entirely cultural. And certainly that was the dominant role of the Asia Society. We had to respond to this and we had a lot of options. The ones that uh, stick with me most are uh, a decision on the part of the Asia Society, which I led, uh, along with John Whitehead, who was then our chairman. Um, to open an office in Hong Kong and to say this is not just something for uh, Americans, this is something that is a collaborative effort between Asian and, uh, Asians and Americans to get to know each other better. And that eventually led to the magnificent new uh, Hong Kong center of the Asia Society. I mean, one of the, the great architectural accomplishments in, in modern Asian history is part of the Asia Society's. Our decision to move ahead with a Hong Kong center began to pick up steam in the late 1980s because there were a lot of people in Hong Kong who were interested in having that happen. It was the most difficult thing, and that is Tiananmen occurred right before we were going to be opening the office. And there was a widespread concern, including in my own heart, that we were in very difficult water, that is, establishing our first center at the point of time that everybody was deeply concerned about what had happened in Tiananmen Square. And uh, I went over to Hong Kong, met with several business people there, government people, and sort of we made a decision, and John Whitehead and I sort of did this together, that we were going to move ahead. Everybody else was leaving at the time. Everybody was saying, it's time to go away. We said, it's not that we're condoning what happened. We were outspoken in our condemnation of it. But it would have been turning our backs on an opportunity that obviously was going to move in a different direction ahead. So we moved ahead. I, I first came as, as head of the China Council, the Asia Society, in 1975. And um, he uh, died two or three years later. But because it was a new program, um, Phil Talbot, who was then the president of the Asia Society, uh, felt that, you know, this young whippersnapper called Robert Oxnum ought to, ought to meet with, with uh, J.D.R. Third, as he was known. And so I had a couple of meetings with him. And yes, he was passionate, but you have to, passionate in a wonderful kind of Rockefeller fashion. You know, there was, you don't want to show too much passion. He was a very steady state figure, but he had a sort of genial quality about him. And his view of Asia was to me like the best old Asia hands. And by that point, he was an old Asia hand. He'd been going since shortly after his graduation from Princeton. 
and he was filled with these sort of tales that, 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 that he would bring into conversations. Uh, he very much wanted to have um, an Asia Society have a new building, which this was in uh, the Asia Society building in 1981. And he very, very much wanted the art collection to their collection of Asian art to be part of it. So he was quite excited that we had a, a China, China program and uh, that I was running. But he, he and Blanchette, his, uh, his wife, were very uh, enthused about what they, uh, they had collected over the years. So, uh, so he gave me a thumbs up. It was a pleasant few meetings I had with him. The Asia Society headquarters building on 70th and Park uh, was inaugurated in 1981. And it was built in the years right before my presidency, under the last years of Phillips Talbot. It was a, um, it was a dream that, that John Rockefeller had, that there would be a new building that, that could house all of the staff and all of the new active programs. Um, and in the process, um, it, was a, uh, it was an effort to create something in which the cultural part of the institution would be quite visible, but there, there would be uh, several different floors for people dealing with education, for people who were dealing with contemporary affairs, uh, for people who were interested in producing you know, the film programs and so forth that we had. And in, in a sense, um, although uh, John Rockefeller didn't live to see it, it was the dream of uh, Philip Talbot, who uh, put an awful lot of uh, effort into it. Um, the one thing that was apparent is when I became president, there we, we had a little shortfall in terms of the fundraising for it. And, uh, you know, I was this guy devoted to Asian studies. I should have taken a, a degree in business administration because I found out there was about a $3 million shortfall and I suddenly had to become a major fundraiser. Who came to the rescue was, was Blanchette Rockefeller who established a matching grant through Elizabeth McCormick, her right-hand person, remarkably astute in how to create fundraising. But within a period of a year, we, we filled that hole and uh, that was an important part of the story. But And for the Asia Society to move from its original goal of educating Americans about Asia to its next goal, which was uh, that of educational activities across the uh, Pacific, to its current effort to bring Asians and Americans together to actually plan that process in a kind of collective fashion. That's probably the longest legacy. So that you're, you're right to ask about people. It, the, this. This mission statements are available in any institution. What brings a mission statement alive is people who are actually committed to that, that kind of notion. So I think that the, uh, the real issue is to create, nurture a spirit on both sides of the Pacific that, uh, in which people feel like they have a genuine stake in a collaborative approach to dealing with difficult moments or new opportunities. And in many ways, uh, the Asia Society is caught up. When I, when I went to the inauguration of the, of the new Hong Kong Center, and you could see a kind of physical manifestation of it, where you had a spectacular art exhibition, contemporary art and traditional art side by side. When you looked at the people in the room representing 30 different countries, when you recognize that there are ongoing programs during the, during the year that link those people in Asia to other parts of Asia. There are many Asians who said, you know, one of the great problems is I come from South Asia. I don't know the history of Korea. I don't know the history of Japan. Asia society plays that kind of role as well as across the Pacific. That to me is a uh, miraculous element that needs to be cherished over time and 
each diff each uh, subsequent president, uh, successive president of the Ejizadi, has to make that interpretation for himself or herself.